And then the problem is the moral problem, which is really what I think even people inclined towards socialist understandings of economics are trying to get to. They're trying to get to it in a very different way than you and I might want to get to it. And that is the command of the gospel to generosity. Welcome to the Act in Line podcast a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. In this episode, Reverend Robert A. Sirico, Acton's President Emeritus, and Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and research associate, dismiss the many misinterpretations of Jesus' parables to reveal their timeless wisdom as explored in Reverend Sirico's new book, The Economics of the Parables. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act Online is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today I am joined by Father Robert Sirico, co-founder and president emeritus of the Acton Institute. Father Robert is also pastor emeritus of Sacred Heart Church here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He is the author of Defending the Free Market, The Moral Case for a Free Economy, as well as innumerable other books, monographs, and articles. He's regularly featured in many newspapers and journals. He speaks widely on religion, economics, and brings a unique synthesis modeling how to think about these issues through the lens of the human person. Most recently, he is the author of The Economics of the Parables, published by Regnery. Today, we'll be discussing that book. The parables are sort of an enduring legacy. Um, They're known to people in and outside the church. And they've captivated the imaginations of many um, for both their timely lessons and sometimes their inscrutability. Um, This is is why we have preaching. What about the parables is there that draws people continually back to them? And why does the Lord so often speak in parables? Well, you know, there's a lot to say about parables and what they are and what they are not. You know, because people think they're they're like fables. They're, They're not fables. They're not fantasy. Uh, These are stories rooted in very accessible human experience. And I think that's, by the way, one of the things that gives them their uh, durability, that people still plant fields, people still have inheritance disputes, they they have wage uh, issues, uh, their supply of Labor, you know, can be problematic as we're seeing today. And all of these things are touched on in an ancient society with very modern accessibility. It helps from time to time to know a little bit of the culture uh, or the language, the particularities of the language. But basically they are enduring um, because they and, – and the economic dimension of it – uh, really brings that to the fore as well because economics existed, though not as an intellectual discipline, but just as a practice of life. People live, we live in a world of scarcity uh, of our time and of our resources, and that's what gives rise to the question of economics. By economics, I don't mean public policy. By economics, I don't mean mathematics. I mean human evaluation of resources and their allocation human action. Uh, And all of that is in the gospel. Now, if I can start with a caveat, because I think it's very important that people understand what I'm not doing here. I am explicitly not eisegeting. I am not bringing my um, philosophy of economics or study of economics or um, political understanding of it to the gospel, nor am I saying that the Gospels are teaching a systematic economics. 
that would be a historical. Um, we can talk about that yeah. a little bit if you want, but uh, go ahead. So this is this is more looking at economics and the parables as part of that cultural background, just like the language, just like customs, just like religion, just like all of that. This economics is in the background as well. And, and not just in Israel of the first century. It, it is human life. I suppose you could do this to the extent that other ancient writers are talking about matters of economics or matters of supply and demand or property. Uh, it, it is human action. It's built into the nature of who human beings are and how they exist. And what I'm trying to say is that this is a presupposition. It's a backdrop in the way language and culture is as well. And we can learn from that and it can point us to something that goes beyond just the economics. So the purpose of the parables is not to teach economics. I'm not yeah. saying that. Yeah. Uh, and I want that to be very clear because there are some exegetes, some writers who do, and I uh, uh, refer to some of them uh, in the course of the book, though it's not a sustained attack on liberation theology's use of Scripture. I do cite certain people and how they attempt to use the Scriptures in what I think is an eisegetical way. Pope St. John Paul II talks about in Centesimus Annis, he talks about how the church proposes no models or right. systems. Of economics, yes. Of economics. And mm -hmm. this is the same with the scriptures themselves. Yes. And, and the other thing that uh, St. John Paul uh, refers to in, the, in that encyclical, he says that the practical world of entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship throws light back onto the gospel. That is, from what we know in economics, we can understand at a, a deeper level uh, the the cause of the gospel. And, and I think I enumerate uh, that throughout the book. Yeah. There are in this book about a, uh, a, a baker's dozen. Right. Thirteen. Uh, Thirteen. Thirteen of them. Parables. And we're just going to discuss two of those today. But um, I think I, I should say, by the way, that there uh, some some scholars estimate that there are two hundred or more parables in the Gospels. Yeah, isn't that something? You know, you don't even think about it, but I mean, it's pervasive. And there are many of these that are just that are just one or two lines. Exactly. Yeah. Now, so one of the most famous parables is the parable of the talents, and this is the first parable I ever heard you speak on. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just read this so our, so our audience, our listeners are oriented. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called on his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his ability. And straightway he took his journey. Then he had received the five talents, went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord." He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. When he which hath received one talent came and said, Lord, I knee, I knew thee that thou art a hard and hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid, 
and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then, at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A hard lesson. Yes, and it's really something. It's, it's just rich. There's there's a lot in it. And by the way, uh, I wanted to mention because you, uh, the, the language I used, I, I chose the King James Bible. <laughs> Very odd. <laughs> yeah, Catholic priest choosing the. But the reason I did is precisely because it is uh, a language with which we are not very familiar. The the stylized version of it, but it's so majestic. Uh, and it also demands our attention. You know, when we read modern uh, scriptures, which are, are uh, modern translations, which are very important for study, mm-hmm. um, but we can just breeze right over them. When we have to kind of stop and look at the construction of the sentence, I think it slows the mechanism down and enables us to meditate more deeply. And that's one of the reasons that I chose to use the King James Version. I, I, I'm also a literature major uh, before I became a priest, so I, I love Elizabethan English. And it parallels also the way the parables are supposed to function themselves. Yes, yes. They're supposed to bring you dramatic. out, and yeah. they're dramatic, yeah. Mm-hmm. But but this particular parable— Yeah, this rich— it, and, it, and it has so many— yeah. Economic angles to it. It does. Um, and it uses those economic lang- angles, of course, to teach us a broader lesson. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you just took it on an, on an economic level, I, I think you wouldn't get the whole of it. The, the, the fact that Jesus is pointing to the kingdom of God, pointing to God's generosity uh, and trust in us, in, a, in effect— you get more out of it. But one of the things that I find so interesting in this particular gospel that's not thought about enough, because you might feel sorry for the the, the guy who doesn't produce anything, Mm -hmm. but it really teaches us about his misperception of who the master is in the first place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really, in in a way, uh, and I... Again, I don't think Jesus had this in mind at all, but in a way it does echo the Marxist critique of a free economy. You you gather where you haven't sown mm-hmm. uh, and you uh, or you gather where you haven't scattered and you reap what you haven't sown in, in effect is what it's saying. And that's exactly the accusation uh, against uh, free exchange that it is exploitative. So that's the first thing that the the servant who is not productive uh, misperceives the master. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is the servant himself says it, the unprofitable servant says, I was afraid. Yeah. Now that both um, on a theological level and on an economic level is significant. On the theological level is we're constantly admonished by Jesus. I don't know if it is. I haven't done a study of this. If it's the most repeated phrase from the mouth of Jesus, but it's certainly repeated over and over again in the Gospels, be not afraid. Be not afraid. And it's repeated by angels. By angels, too. Yes. You know, and, and what God is telling us is that uh, you know, fear paralyzes us. It disables us from seeing what we, what we must see around us. But on the economic level— uh, one of the things that I think people don't appreciate about uh, entrepreneurship is that it requires a certain set sense of uh, reasonable risk, that the entrepreneur takes a risk to invest what is seen in order to obtain what is not yet seen. And I think that 
element comes into play here. It would have been interesting, and by the way, I think this is also part of the enduring power of these parables. They're vague in a sense. They don't always give you the answer. Sometimes Jesus does, but they don't always give you the answer. They set up things and they leave things hanging and there's no resolution to them. The vagueness incites meditation because here's an example of it. What would Jesus have done if he'd come back and the guy who made 10 out of the five or the guy who made four out of the two, whatever it is, there, there actually there are several versions of this um, same story in some of the synoptic gospels. Um, what if they had not been profitable but had risked? That, that would have been a whole other parable. Now, it's a parable we don't have, so we, it, it has to stay on the level of speculation. But the very process of meditating on it brings out some of the qualities of God. And all of this is occurring in the context of an economic uh, world that uh, it teaches about profit. It teaches us about investment. It teaches about interest rates mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and scarcity, you know, so – yeah, and it also it, it it teaches us broader lessons. Too. I mean, the way we use the word talent today, yes, comes from this. Comes from this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we're we're all endowed with gifts in this life. Um, some more remarkable than others, but all valuable, and all capable of generating good. Yes. Of generating something we can give back to the Lord in service. Um, and that fear is the obstacle to so many things. It really is. It, yeah. it petrifies us. It, 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 I mean, think about the word petrifying. It just keeps something not dynamic, whereas creativity can be a response to uh, faithfulness. If we're going to be faithful to the master, we have to be creative. And the creativity is risky. And you you just have to see that the master would have understood that. So there's another 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 parable that I wanted to discuss here. And this is this is from uh the Gospel of Luke. Uh this is the parable of the rich fool, which gets into some of the ways in which, okay, how do how are these economic questions how do they relate? And what, and what happens when the economic realities become in conflict with other values we have in a society? Yeah. Um, so and we'll begin here. This is uh, Luke uh, 12, 13 through 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge and divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake the parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So it is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is fascinating. And some of the cultural background here is key to understanding of inheritance law. Yeah, because the, the I mean, we think of the, the parable of the rich fool, but it, it occurs as a result of a family dispute, an inheritance dispute, not, not the only example in the parables of inheritance disputes, by the way. You know, yeah. you, you've got the prodigal son, which turns into that. But uh, so that's the context from which this this whole gospel arises. And the younger son who comes to Jesus um, was in a legal dilemma because the older son really does get more 
of the inheritance accordingly. But the older son in Jewish law, and there's a, there's a bunch of commentary on this, would have been expected to have sustained the father in his old age uh, or, or the mother or the whole household, including his siblings. So there's some complexities here, and the, and the way Jesus wants to deflect this and then focuses on what is really a value, and that's where we get into the actual uh, the parable part of this text. Yeah. And this is something, you know, I, I, I spent some years in college working at a funeral home. And when you do that, you see this come out. Um, you mean the inheritance questions? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. And you hear the grumbling and you see that really hurt relationships. Um, oh, it's, it's so I'm, devastating yeah, sometimes. I'm, I'm I mean, sure I've dealt with that many, pastorally. Yeah. You know, um, thankfully, my parents never had enough to leave us for us to have fought over it. But I mean, it, it is that um, it it can turn good people into divisive people at the very least. Yeah. And so, so this whole first part of the parable, which is not really the parable proper, the occasion of the parable, is very interesting from an economic point of view as well. Yeah. Now, outside of the parables, uh, if I could just, yeah. by the way, point out one thing about the oh, yes. the rich yeah. fool himself. I, I I suspect, though, I couldn't find this in my own research, that this is where we get the phrase "you can't take it with you." Yeah, uh, and Ambrose has a, a lovely line. It, it, Ambrose says, and I I quote it in in the book: "Virtue is the companion of the dead." Mercy alone follows us, and mercy alone gains abode for the departed. So that the, the 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 lesson of this is that this rich man who's going to store up all this stuff and then die um, doesn't really have too much. He really has too little. <laughs> you know, there's no mention of a family here. There's no mention of a legacy. It's only these material things that he's storing up in a barn uh, or a storage house. Yeah. Uh, but there's no no family, no, and and how lonely it must be to be enormously wealthy, wealthy, and walk around and just look at your possessions. There's something there that doesn't satisfy the inner need of the human person. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of point that out. Yeah, and it and it and it and it can't. Because no. you can't take it with you. <laughs> well, because you can't take it with you, and also because the human heart. What we desire is eternity. Mm -hmm. And the things you can put in a barn by their very definition are transient. These are things that need to be protected, that are scarce, uh, and therefore perishable. And the human person isn't in, in the deepest meaning uh, of what it is to be human. So... As I am reading this book, I am left with just as many questions as the, answers. The, about well, that's the, the parables. Yeah, that's the parables themselves. You you don't read the parables and not think uh, of more. You know, it's it's that thing I said earlier about the vagueness of the parables are what invite and incite uh, deeper reflection. the The other part, by the way, of parables uh, that I found uh, and one of their reasons for their, their durability, is that they speak simultaneously to varieties of audiences. So you can have a, a brilliant intellectual and a kid hear the same parable and they both can reflect on it. You know, the modern example of that, and I, I hope that I'm not being um, too facetious, I always thought was the, um, the Muppets. And I should say the early Muppets, not the, the modern Muppets, which have become very politically correct and woke and all of that. But the original Muppet show was brilliant because it would bring children and their parents to watch and laugh, though laughing at different things. Uh, and the parables, in a way, are teaching you personally in a group of people because each person is being taught different lessons because of exactly what you said. You're left with these open-ended questions. Well, what about this and what about that? Yeah. So 
as you were working on this, now you've preached on these for many years. Sure, you know, you you have a, a almost three and a half, four decades of preaching <laughs> on, on things. These are going to come up. That's how the book began, by the way, were my homily notes. And then I began to just kind of uh, augment them with uh, economic insights. Yeah. So you've got the economic insights. You go back to earlier figures in the church. You brought up Ambrose. You go to modern commentators. Right, right. Um, and I've used a variety of them here, you know, not just – uh, Catholic and not just conservative, because there are real insights that come from all kinds of people who've been reading these things and researching the information, the cultural backgrounds, the language. What was what was one of the most startlingly helpful resources you found in your own sort of investigation as you were going through, as you were as you were sort of. Where did you find surprising lessons? Well, of course, you know, the classic commentator on the parables would be Yoram, Joachim Yoramias. Uh, and he's written several books that include uh, detailed studies of the, the cultural and economic and theological contexts in which – uh, all of this happens. So I think the classical stuff is not to be ignored. But you have uh, two particular scholars who impress. well, let me say three. Uh, two were Arland Holtgren, who is a professor um, emeritus of New Testament Luther Seminary, uh, who wrote a, an extensive commentary, thick commentary, was very helpful, and Klein Snodgrass, who is, uh, again, a professor of New Testament, emeritus professor of New Testament studies at North Park Theological Seminary. These two were very helpful. But also, uh, Joseph Ratzinger has a marvelous uh, section in one of his volumes on Jesus of Nazareth. What I like about Ratzinger is his willingness to engage the historical form-critical method, but without losing his faith in the process. And uh, the other thing about Ratzinger is he distills. You know, when you're reading the other commentaries, you know what other people have said on these things. And when you then read Ratzinger is you see in very succinct, abbreviated form that he's already digested all of this stuff and brings it to a one-sentence focus. So those are some of the um, – the people were you were you talking about points? No, uh, no, no. or I, I, commentators. The, the, the commentators, yeah, no, because there are yeah there are names that continue to come up. I love the way that you use um, Pope Benedict the the, the sixteenth, uh, formerly Cardinal Ratzinger, to sort of set up the question in the beginning yes. of what are parables. Um, there's an expression that gets used over and over again by Christ of the New Testament. Let him who has ears to hear, yes. hear. Yeah. What, you know, these parables are sometimes told before large audiences. Right. They're sometimes told privately to the disciples. What is what is the role of of the of the parables obscurity? Even sometimes in these public contexts, when the Lord Lord seems to allude to it Himself, that not everyone will hear and understand. Yeah, because um, our hearts have to be. I mean, to to use the image that's given in one of the um, uh, the parable of the sowers, the the soil is different, and the one who has to hear has to be this. We have a responsibility to till the soil to to nourish the soil, and so I think this is at least part of what. Um, and you have to say that all the time. This is a part of what it's about, that that our own hearts need to be prepared to be receptive to what the, the insight is. Sometimes uh, a lesson of a parable will so irritate us uh, that we won't hear it. We'll close down. So what... Uh, what Jesus is saying and saying, let him who has ears to hear, uh, talks about the preparation that we need to have yeah. to receive the message. And it's also um, an encouragement that if maybe 
if maybe it remains inscrutable to us, that we can approach it maybe later in life yeah. with a different attitude, with a different insight. And it can be it can be it can be disclosed to us and we can and we can and we can learn from it then. There's you know, there's so many commentaries on on the New Testament and uh, on the parables in particular. And having read and as you say preached on these things for so many years, I really kind of thought I would just come and uh, put this together. But I have to say, uh, there were some things that I just hadn't noticed before, little little gems, little pieces, that as I was thinking more deeply, uh, one of them would be uh, not in a parable, uh, at the end of the book, uh, probably a third of this yeah. book is the afterward that I wrote, which is a further uh, set of uh, thoughts on economics in the New Testament. Um one of the things that, that hit me as I was reading this, again, now from an economic point of view, is that famous passage where the young man comes to Jesus and want, the rich young ruler comes yeah. to Jesus and wants to be his follower. Um, and the way you always hear that gospel is, well, Jesus tells him to give up everything and follow him. True, true enough. But what does he say? And I checked it out in all of the versions and all of the languages, the you know, translations of it. The first thing Jesus says to the man is go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. First of all, he says to sell. He's admonished to engage in commerce, which in the process of that means uh, – if you're really going to sell something, you're you're engaged in negotiation. You're trying to get the best price. And he wants to get the best price because if part of what he's going to do with this is uh, to distribute it to the poor, you, your ability a, as a um, – in commerce is going to uh, redound to your ability to serve. Th there's a whole economic <laughs> yeah. lesson in that right there. The other thing is it doesn't say that he told him to give everything that he had to the poor. Uh, just sell what you have and give to the poor, not give it all to the poor. That's not in, in the text. Oh, okay. It may, may very well be, yeah. but it's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that struck me that I hadn't noticed that before. This, of course, this whole story gives rise to the most well, – probably the metaphor I'm most asked about is, uh, can, can a rich man go to heaven? It's yeah. easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich person to get in the kingdom of heaven. How do you answer that? Um, and by the way, um, <laughs> everybody always says, well, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people yeah. will say, um, well, Jesus was referring to this door in Jerusalem, in the wall of Jerusalem, that was small and was used at night so people who arrived late could come in. But to get through it, you had to unburden your camels, take all your belongings off, get the camel through, and then bring your goods in, and then remount the camel. Uh, and see, this is what it means. You have to unload. That sounds wonderful. But it's not true. This eye of the needle in the wall of, wall of Jerusalem, it was, I think, built in the, the 16th century, the Middle Ages anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it, what, it couldn't possibly have been what Jesus was referring to. No, he was trying to use this, this form of hyperbole to say you can't get into the kingdom of heaven by virtue of your riches. And that's what Jesus says. To his disciples, because it's not just us who have questions about the parables. The disciples, they say, well, then who can get into heaven? Yeah. And then what does Jesus say? With man, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. With God, all things are possible. Now, there's, there's one other very common question about the church and economics that you address in this afterward that's not in the parables, but it's uh, in the book of Acts. Oh, yes. In the early yes. church. Yes. Um, you know, uh, some folks will say that they they held property in common, that they, uh, in fact, you know, somebody like uh, David Bentley Hart has referred to this explicitly as, you know, the church was engaged in, in a sort of primitive communism. Yeah, so of course he gets that from Marx. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Marx like that. What what? How do you think we should see that 
um, I think you should just read the whole thing and not just that one passage that they held all things common. Yeah. Uh, because as you read Acts, and by the way, um, the commentator who is very helpful, the Anglican um, Luke— um, Timothy Johnson? Luke Timothy Johnson, who's a wonderful. He wrote, I think it was his dissertation, on the relation of possessions in Luke Acts. It's just a dissertation. It's not even, I don't think it's uh, popularly published. I got it from the academic house, and it was an old copy that I was able to obtain through uh, Amazon. God bless it. Yeah. Um, and uh, he does a magnificent analysis across the board on Luke Acts, but in particular in this this passage in Acts uh, on whether the whole church held things common, even the passage about Ananias and Sapphira reveals explicitly Peter saying, when you had the property, was it not your own? And after you sold it, did not it remain your property? And then the problem is the moral problem, which is really what I think even people inclined towards socialist understandings of economics are trying to get to. They're trying to get to it in a very different way than you and I might want to get to it. And that is the command of the gospel to generosity. And I don't think you can achieve that high ideal through legislative action. I think it takes the conversion of heart, which Ananias and Sapphira did not have, obviously. Yeah. They, if they just wanted to give a portion of their money, they could have done that uh, and save their lives. Um, and there's a whole question of, did, did the apostles have money? Well, of course they did, because there was a common purse. Well, you say, well, that was a common purse. But it was, it was money that was collected and saved and valued as such. And you see, you know, Paul being a tent maker elsewhere, also in, in the book of Acts. So the whole question is how to touch money lightly, how to put it to service and not to uh, demonize it somehow. What we know is that this was an experiment in the early church, and in times of crisis, we might want to, um, you know, share among, ration among, but in a general um, society, the rationing takes place through the information we receive through market exchange, that something's of more value or less value to pay, uh, depending on its price. Father Robert, this is a fascinating book. And Thank you. And is an invitation to inquiry. There's, there's one thing that I, I didn't want to neglect to mention, and which was a surprise as I read it, um, is the illustrations. Oh, yes, yes. There are wonderful uh, sketches, uh, engravings of scenes of these parables throughout um, that it's really interesting when you, when, you, when you read the parables and you point out some of these, uh, some of these in, you know, in the parable of the hidden treasure, for instance, you know, uh, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden a field, the, uh, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he had, and buyeth the, that field. Now, there's no details as to how he came upon this treasure. How did he come upon it? What was it doing in the ground? <laughs> yep. And, and then he takes it out and puts it back. Yep. <laughs> and goes and gets and, you know, th this just raises a whole bunch of economic questions. Yeah, and in uh, in one of the illustrations, not to be confused, by the way, with the pearl of great price. Yes, because that, that you can confuse that because he also sells all that he has and buys it. But one you come upon uh, in in nature uh, that is that's hidden. Yep. The other is not. It, it's it's not manufactured. The pearl, and it's a luxury item. Yeah. One little luxury item that he sells everything for that was available on the market because he buys it from someone else rather mm -hmm. than finds it. So. Yeah. No, and there's and there's all in the in the picture is of a man plowing a field. And this is yes. how he discovers it. Right, right. And it's right. interesting how these parables have have so ingrained themselves into the imagination. That through reflection, they, they they take on a life 
in our imagination um, in really interesting ways um, and allow us to explore all the different possibilities latent within them. Um, the Pearl of Great Price print is is a great is a very uh, you see it it's it's a very it's an exchange you, you yes. look at it it's 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 it is the conclusion or or perhaps beginning of a negotiation right. um, and and these pictures help paint a picture of just how transformative uh, the parables can be to the way we think through these things and the way that not only scholars but also artists have worked their way through these things. Father Robert, it has been wonderful having you, Thank you. today. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. I really enjoyed writing this book and, and especially studying uh, the commentators on this because it's just enriched me spiritually as, as, as I wrote it. Yeah. It, it did the same for me, and it caused further questions, which is the Bingo. which is the best <laughs> thing that a book can do is, right. is cause you to turn back. Anytime any work on theology causes you to go back to the scriptures themselves and to revisit them anew and afresh is a wonderful thing. Thank you so much Thank you. for this gift. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa.